Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and distinguished guests. Please remain standing for the presentation of colors and our national anthem. To begin the program, please welcome the Mayor of Dallas, Mike Rawlings. Please be seated. Good afternoon. Welcome. At 8.58 p.m., Five days ago, the soul of our city was pierced when police officers were ambushed in a cowardly attack. In the days that followed, we have searched a massive crime scene. We've sobbed and paid tribute at a growing memorial at the police headquarters. We prayed together at Thanksgiving Square. We lit candles to honor the lives of our five heroes. Today, we open our city's doors to our friends and to our neighbors. We realize that our pain is your pain. You want to do what we want to do, honor the lives of these five officers. Lauren Ahrens, Michael Kroll, Michael Smith, Brent Thompson, Patricio Zamarit. On behalf of the Dallas citizens and our great Dallas City Council, we want to say thank you and thank you for accepting our invitation. Some of you have traveled from across our state and some from across our country. I want to recognize my fellow mayors from out of state for being here on such short notice. Oklahoma City Mayor Mick Cornett, New Orleans Mayor Mitchell Andrew, Columbia Mayor Stephen Benjamin, Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher, thank you. 
Thank you also to my friend, Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price, to our state's first lady, Cecilia Abbott, and daughter, Audrey Abbott, who are here on behalf of Gregor, uh, Governor Greg Abbott, to Governor Jay Nixon of Missouri, and Governor Susanna Martinez of New Mexico, and to our congressmen and women. You represent elected officials and your citizens across the country who have reached out to me in recent days and who weren't able to make it here today, whose cities and states have also been scarred by violence. Congresswoman Johnson, Senator Cornyn, Senator Cruz, these men and women are here with us because they know we have a common disease, this absurd violence on our streets. Those that will help us fight it are our men and women in blue, our peacemakers in blue. They have died for that cause. That is why today we reserve five seats for the men we lost on Thursday night. We offer our gratitude to you, our cops, including those who have traveled here to support your brothers and sisters in the Dallas Police Department, the Dallas Area Rapid Transit Police, and the El Centro College Police Force. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for coming. Most importantly, it is our purpose today to, be, to bring comfort to you, the families who are represented by those empty seats. We love you. We will never forget you. We also honor those who came close to death that night and who were wounded not only in the body, but in the soul. May you never be forgotten as well. We understand that Dallas's pain is a national pain. That is why I want to say thank you to President Obama and First Lady Mrs. Obama, Vice President Biden and Dr. Biden, and to two of our most distinguished citizens of Dallas, President Bush and Laura Bush, for coming to help us heal these wounds. To wage this battle against violence and separatism, today must be about unity. Unity among faiths, unity among police and citizens, and yes, unity among politicians. In recent days, I've seen unity even before that tragedy, when police and protesters mingle peacefully I've seen unity when the protesters came out in support of the police after the days of this tragedy. I see unity today when the Arlington police and the Texas DPS officers step up to relieve our exhausted police officers. This interfaith choir behind me symbolizes that unity coming from six churches across our city. These three religious leaders, Imam Omar Suleiman, Rabbi Andrew Mark Paley, and Dr. Sharon Patterson, will pray in a few minutes in a show of unity. I believe you'll hear words of unity from other speakers, the senior senator from Texas, John Cornyn, President Bush, Police Chief David Brown, and President Obama. The past few days have been some of the darkest in our city's histories. There's no question about that. As we bury these men in the coming days, it will not get easier. I know. But there's nothing like a crisis that forces one to take pause of your life and your city's life. And if you're from out of town, I, I hope you'll forgive me for a moment I want to speak to my fellow Dallasites. 
I have searched hard in my soul of late to discover what mistakes we have made. I've asked, why us? And in my moments of self-doubt, I discovered the truth that we did nothing wrong. In fact, Dallas is very, very good. Our police are among the best in the country. I am in awe of our Dallas police officers. We set the standard where policing can both be strong and smart, where men die for the rights that this country was built on. In short, I have never been more proud of my city, our city. While we did nothing wrong, there is a reason this happened here, this place, this time in American history. This is our chance to lead and build a new model for a community, for a city, for our country. To do that, there will be tough times ahead. We will mourn together. And together is the key word here. We may be sad, but we will not dwell in self-pity. We may weep, but we will never whine. For we have too much work to be done. We have too many bridges to build that we will cross together. This I know, this I know will happen. Thank you. Let every head be bowed, every eye closed, as we go to God in prayer. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Lord, our hearts are heavy, our spirits are torn asunder, and tears flow from our eyes. And we come to you, O oh God, because you are the rock in the weary land. You are the shelter in the time of storm, and God, you are uniquely qualified to come see about your people. From Genesis to Revelations, you have helped and healed and mended and molded. Right now, oh God, we salute the five slain Dallas police officers who died protecting and serving this community. We honor their sacrifice and commitment. Surround their families and loved ones with your Holy Ghost power. Cover the entire Dallas Police Department with your grace and your mercy. And Lord, keep your hands of everlasting love on our Chief David Brown as he leads with dignity and determination. God, your word says all things work together for good. We can't see that right now, but we'll trust you when we can't trace you. Lord, your word says weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Right now it's still dark, but we're going to hold on to your unchanging hand. Yes, there will be lingering effects from Thursday's ambush. There is terror, anxiety, and despair. But in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, we will keep on, we will press on, we will love on, we will live on. Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God and true to America. Let the church say amen. amen. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, 
May his peace and blessings be upon his prophets and messengers and all those that follow in their blessed path. Today our city is heartbroken, our country is soul-searching, and we as individuals are forever in need of your guidance and protection. We ask you to look upon us today to guide us to live our lives in ways that are most pleasing to you. We ask you to put peace in our hearts that we, that we may spread it to all of those around us. We ask you to protect us from being people of injustice, that we may purify the world of it. And as we ask you, we recognize that it is up to us to say, you did not create us for bigotry or vengeance. You did not create us to dominate or oppress one another. You did not create us for war. We are not the ones to judge who should live and who should die. So today we stand before you in humility and in determination, ready to pursue the peace, justice, and equality that you demand of us, ready to stand up against all of the evil that threatens to destroy the goodness in your creation, ready to stand up against any oppression in any name, for any cause, from any position, and against any of your creation. We ask that your love would comfort those who mourn their loved ones today, that their memory would flood their families with joy, that the children of our fallen officers and all of those who have lost their lives to senseless violence are molded in the love that we express today, not in the hatred that claimed the lives of their fathers. We ask that the voices of racism and xenophobia that seek to divide us are drowned out by the chorus of voices that say, you will not pit us against one another. We choose today to live by the hope that you've instilled within us, not the fears that others manufacture amongst us. And with that, we pray to you, the one God of Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and us all, for one Dallas, one America, and one world. Amen. Dear friends, together we are here opening our hearts and our souls to the God of compassion as the simple human beings that we are, as mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, all children of the heavenly parent, all created in the divine image, and all here today to pray for healing, for wisdom, for strength, and for peace. In this moment of sadness and pain, we look to the heavens knowing, as the poet Hannah Senesh once said, there are stars up above, so far away we only see their light, long after the star itself is gone. And so it is with the people that we loved. Their memories keep shining ever brightly, though the time with us is done. But the stars that light up the darkest night, these are the stars that guide us. As we live our days, these are the ways we remember. As we live our days, we remember Brent Thompson, Patrick Zemaripa, Michael Kroll, Lauren Ahrens, and Michael Smith. They will be remembered as shining lights of bravery, dedication to our city, kindness, and compassion. As we live our days, we will never forget their sacrifice. As our city is still reeling from the violence of only a few short days ago, we beseech you, O oh God, healer of the brokenhearted, with the words of Moses as he prayed for healing for his sister Miriam, Elna Rafana La, please God, heal her. And so we pray to the families of our fallen Dallas police officers, and Dallas Area Regional Transit Police Officer, we pray, Elna Rafana Laham, please God, heal them as we ask for your healing power to surround them and their loved ones in this, their time of need, with hope, with strength, and with love. To those who survived the violence but who will always bear the burden of scars and memory, we pray, Elna Rafana Laham, please God, heal them and bring to their bodies and souls the wholeness and completeness they seek. To our elected officials and police and first responders, 
into whose hands we place our lives, we pray, Elna Rafan Allahem, please God, heal them, as we know they hurt along with us. And bring to them, O oh God, the wisdom and the courage necessary to make the permanent peace we seek. And to those of us who are scared and afraid, angry and confused in our city and in our country, we pray, El Na Rafan Alanu, please God, heal us as we ask for your healing power to heal us once and for all from the illness of violence, of hatred xenophobia, and indifference that plagues us every single day. God, you who must work daily to make peace throughout the heavens, we ask you this day to give us the courage and strength to help us make peace here on earth for everyone, every single day, and together we say, Amen. Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator John Cornyn. I know I speak for everyone here and around the country in expressing my profound gratitude to Mayor Rawlings, Chief Brown, and the entire Dallas and DART police departments. We thank you for your strength and the grace you've shown in these trying hours. Chief, I particularly like the way you put it yesterday when you said simply that Dallas loves. It's my solemn privilege to join the people of Dallas all across the state of Texas and the entire country in honoring these men of uncommon courage. Several years ago, in the aftermath of another tragedy, the shocking explosion in West Texas, a local official told me something that sticks with me even to this day. He said, being a Texan doesn't describe where you're from. It describes who your family is. So today, our family and this great nation shares the grief of Dallas. I want to especially thank President Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, Vice President Biden, and Dr. Jill Biden for honors, honoring us by your presence here today. In times of darkness, when it's hard to hold on to hope, we must remember that these men, along with their fellow officers, were not ultimately overcome by evil. No, as scripture directs us, I believe they chose to confront evil and overcome it with good. They overcame evil by running from this, toward the sound of the gunfire. They overcame evil by shielding their fellow citizens from the spray of bullets. They overcame evil by sacrificing their own lives so that others could live. And I believe that because of their example to all of us, the city of Dallas shall overcome the evil from that day. Amidst our profound sadness, we honor and remember these officers for putting the people of Dallas before themselves and in their final moments serving others, protecting this city, and loving this community as they did. Today we join millions across our state and country who continue to lift up these families, friends, and fellow officers in our prayers, as well as those recovering from their wounds. In the aftermath of another life-altering event on September the 11th, 2001, President George W. Bush inspired all of us in speaking of how this nation has always responded to evil with powerful courage and deep concern for one another. And so once again, we gather as one nation under God Yes, to grieve, but then to rise up and to continue to fight the good fight, to finish the race, and to keep the faith. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to welcome to the podium the 43rd President of the United States, part of our Texas family, and a man who, along with his bride, Laura, proudly call this community their home, President George W. Bush. Thank you. All. 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, too, uh, am really pleased that President Obama and Mrs. Obama have come down to Dallas. I also want to welcome Vice President and Mrs. Biden, Mr. Mayor, Chief Brown, elected officials, members of the law enforcement community. Today, the nation grieves, but those of us who love Dallas and call it home have had five deaths in the family. Laura and I see members of law enforcement every day. We count, we count them as our friends. And we know, like for every other American, that their courage is our protection and shield. We're proud of the men we mourn and the community that has rallied to honor them and support the wounded. Our mayor and police chief and our police department have been mighty inspirations for the rest of the nation. <laughs> These slain officers were the best among us. Lauren Ahrens, beloved husband to Detective Katrina Ahrens and father of two. Michael Kroll, caring son, brother, uncle, nephew, and friend. Michael Smith, U.S. Army veteran, devoted husband and father of two. Brent Thompson, Marine Corps vet, recently married. Patrick Zamaripa, U.S. Navy Reserve combat veteran, proud father, and loyal Texas Rangers fan. With their deaths, we have lost so much. We are grief-stricken, heartbroken, and forever grateful. Every officer has accepted a calling that sets them apart. Most of us imagine if the moment called for that we would risk our lives to protect a spouse or a child. Those wearing the uniform assume that risk for the safety of strangers. They and their families share the unspoken knowledge that each new day can bring new dangers. But none of us were prepared or could be prepared for an ambush by hatred and malice. The shock of this evil still has not faded. At times, it seems like the forces pulling us apart are stronger than the forces binding us together. Argument turns too easily into animosity. Disagreement escalates too quickly into dehumanization. Too often we judge other groups by their worst examples, while judging ourselves by our best intentions. And this is... And this has strained our bonds of understanding and common purpose. But Americans, I think, have a great advantage. To renew our unity, we only need to remember our values. We have never been held together by blood or background. We are bound by things of the spirit, by shared commitments to common ideals. At our best, we practice empathy imagining ourselves in the lives and circumstances of others. This is the bridge across our nation's deepest divisions. And it's not merely a matter of tolerance, but of learning from the struggles and stories of our fellow citizens and finding our better selves in the process. At our best, we honor the image of God we see in one another. We recognize that we are brothers and sisters sharing the same brief moment on earth and owing each other the loyalty of our shared humanity. At our best, we know we have one country, one future, one destiny. We do not want the unity of grief, nor we want the unity of fear. We want the unity of hope, affection, and high purpose. We know that the kind of just, humane country we want to build that we have seen in our best dreams is made possible when men and women in uniform stand guard. 
at their best when they're trained and trusted and accountable. They free us from fear. The Apostle Paul said, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of strength and love and self-control. Those are the best responses to fear in the life of our country. And they're the code of the peace officer. Today, all of us feel a sense of loss, but not equally. I'd like to conclude with the word of the families, the spouses, and especially the children of the fallen. Your loved one's time with you was too short. They did not get a chance to properly say goodbye. But they went where duty called. They defended us, even to the end. They finished well. We will not forget what they did for us. Your loss is unfair. We cannot explain it. We can stand beside you and share your grief. And we can pray that God will comfort you with a hope deeper than sorrow and stronger than death. May God bless you. Leadership is hard. Great leadership is very unique. We experienced that leadership this week with the chiefs of our DART and DPD offices. I want to say thanks to DART Chief James Speller for what you have done. And I want to also introduce a man who has given his life to the city of Dallas, the 28th Chief of Police, over 30 years in the force, a native of South Oak Cliff. A man that I call a friend, but more importantly, he is my rock. He represents not only Dallas, but police officers, police chiefs, this higher calling across the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief David Brown. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. When I was a teenager and started liking girls, 
I, I could never find the right words to express myself. And after a couple of words, they just walk away, leaving me <laughs> figuring out what do I need to do to get a date. And so being a, a music fan of 1970s rhythm and blues love songs, I put together a strategy to recite the lyrics <laughs> to get a date. So for girls I liked, I would pull out some Al Green or some Teddy Pendergrass or some <laughs> Isley Brothers, and I'd recite the lyrics to their love songs. But for people I loved, if I fell in love with a girl, oh, I had to dig down deep and get some Stevie Wonder. to fully express the love I had for the, for the girl. So today, I'm going to pull out some Stevie Wonder for these families. So families, close your eyes and just imagine me back in 1974 with an afro and some bell bottoms and wide collar. We all know sometimes life's hate and troubles can make you wish you were born in another time and place. But you can bet your lifetimes that, and twice as double, that God knew exactly where the he wanted you to be placed. So make sure when you say you're not in it, but not of it, you're not helping to make this earth a place sometimes called hell. Change your words into truth, and then change that truth into love. And maybe your children's grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren will tell them, I'll be loving you until the rainbow burns the stars out of the sky I'll be loving you until the ocean covers every mountain high I'll be loving you until the dolphin flies and the parrots live at the sea I'll be loving you until we dream of life and life becomes a dream I'll be loving you until the day is night and night becomes the day I'll be loving to you until the trees and seas up, up, and fly away I'll be loving you. Until the day that eight times, eight times, eight times, eight is four, I'll be loving you. Until the day that is the day that are no more I'll be loving you. Until the day the earth starts turning right to the left I'll be loving you. Until the earth, just for the sun, denies itself, I'll be loving you. Until Mother Nature says her work is through, I'll be loving you. Until the day that you are me and I am you. Now, ain't that loving you? <laughs> Until the rainbow burns the stars out of the sky. Ain't that loving you? Until the ocean covers every mountain high. And I've got to say, always, I'll be loving you always. And there's no greater love than this, that these five men gave their lives for all of us, it is my honor to introduce to you the President of the United States of America, President Barack Obama. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. President and Mrs. Bush, my friend, the Vice President, and Dr. Biden, Mayor Rawlings, Chief Spiller, clergy, members of Congress, Chief Brown. I'm so glad I met Michelle first, because she loves Stevie Wonder. <laughs> Most of all, the families and friends and colleagues and fellow officers. Scripture tells us that in our sufferings, there is glory because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. Sometimes the truths of these words are hard to see. Right now, those words test us. Because the people of Dallas, people across the country, are suffering. We're here to honor the memory and mourn the loss of five fellow Americans, to grieve with their loved ones, to support this community. to pray for the wounded, and to try and find some meaning amidst our sorrow. For the men and women who protect and serve the people of Dallas, last Thursday began like any other day. Like most Americans, each day you get up, probably have too quick a breakfast, kiss your family goodbye, and you head to work. But your work and the work of police officers across the country is like no other. For the moment you put on that uniform, you have answered a call that at any moment even in the briefest interaction, they put your life in harm's way. Lauren Aarons, he answered that call. So did his wife, Kat Katrina. Not only because she was the spouse of a police officer, but because she's a detective on the force. They have two kids. And Lauren took them fishing and used to proudly go to their school in uniform. And the night before he died, he bought dinner for a homeless man. And the next night, Katrina had to tell their children that their dad was gone. And they don't get it yet, their grandma said. They don't know what to do quite yet. Michael Kroll answered that call. His mother said he knew the dangers of the job, but he never shied away from his duty. He came a thousand miles from his home state of Michigan to be a cop in Dallas.
telling his family, this is something I wanted to do. And last year, he brought his girlfriend back to Detroit for Thanksgiving, and it was the last time he'd see his family. Michael Smith answered that call. In the Army, and over almost 30 years working for the Dallas Police Association, which gave him the appropriately named Cops Cop Award. A man of deep faith. When he was off duty, he could be found at church or playing softball with his two girls. Today, his girls have lost their dad, for God has called Michael home. Patrick Zamaripa, he answered that call. Just 32, a former altar boy who served in the Navy and dreamed of being a cop. He liked to post videos of himself and his kids on social media. And on Thursday night, while Patrick went to work, his partner Christy posted a photo of her and their daughter at a Texas Rangers game and tagged her partner so that he could see it while on duty. Brent Thompson answered that call. He served his country as a Marine. And years later, as a contractor, he spent time in some of the most dangerous parts of Iraq and Afghanistan. And then a few years ago, he settled down here in Dallas for a new life of service as a transit cop. And just about two weeks ago, he married a fellow officer. their whole life together waiting before them. Like police officers across the country, these men and their families shared a commitment to something larger than themselves. They weren't looking for their names to be up in lights. They'd tell you the pay was decent, but wouldn't make you rich. They could have told you about the stress and long shifts, and they'd probably agree with Chief Brown when he said that cops don't expect to hear the words thank you very often, especially from those who need them the most. No, the, the reward comes in knowing that our entire way of life in America depends on the rule of law. that the maintenance of that law is a hard and daily labor. That in this country, we don't have soldiers in the streets or malicious setting the rules. Instead, we have public servants, police officers, like the men who were taken away from us. And that's what these five were doing last Thursday when they were assigned to protect and keep orderly a peaceful protest in response to the killing of Alton Sterling of Baton Rouge and Philando Castile of Minnesota. They were upholding the constitutional rights of this country. For a while, the protest went on without incident. And despite the fact that police conduct was the subject of the protest, despite the fact that there must have been signs or slogans or chants with which they profoundly disagreed, these men and this department did their jobs like the professionals that they were. In fact, the police had been part of the protest planning. Dallas PD even posted photos on their Twitter feeds of their own officers standing among the protesters. Two officers, black and white, smiled next to a man with a sign that read, no justice, no peace. And then around 9 o'clock, 
the gunfire came. Another community torn apart, more hearts broken, more questions about what caused and what might prevent another such tragedy. I know that Americans are struggling right now with what we've witnessed over the past week. First, the shootings in Minnesota and Baton Rouge, the protests, then the targeting of police by the shooter here, an act not just of demented violence but of racial hatred. All of it's left us wounded and angry and hurt. It's as if the deepest fault lines of our democracy have suddenly been exposed, perhaps even widened. And although we know that such divisions are not new, though they've surely been worse in even the recent past, that offers us little comfort. Faced with this violence, we wonder if the divides of race in America can ever be bridged. We wonder if an African-American community that feels unfairly targeted by police and police departments that feel unfairly maligned for doing their jobs can ever understand each other's experience. We turn on the TV or surf the Internet and we can watch positions harden and lines drawn and people retreat to their respective corners. And politicians calculate how to grab attention or avoid the fallout. We see all this, and it's hard not to think sometimes that the center won't hold and that things might get worse. I understand. I understand how Americans are feeling. But Dallas, I'm here to say we must reject such despair. I'm here to insist that we are not as divided as we seem. And I know that because I know America. I know how far we've come against impossible odds. I know will make it because of what I've experienced in my own life, what I've seen of this country and its people, their goodness and decency as President of the United States. And I know it because of what we've seen here in Dallas, how all of you, out of great suffering, have shown us the meaning of perseverance and character and hope. When the bullets started flying, the men and women of the Dallas police, they did not flinch, and they did not react recklessly. They showed incredible restraint. Helped in some cases by protesters, they evacuated the injured, isolated the shooter, Save more lives than we will ever know. We mourn fewer people today because of your brave actions. Everyone was helping each other, one witness said. It wasn't about black or white. Everyone was picking each other up and moving them away. See, that's the America I know. The police helped Shatamia Taylor as she was shot, trying to shield her four sons. 
She said she wanted her boys to join her to protest the incidents of black men being killed. She also said to the Dallas PD, thank you for being heroes. And today her 12-year-old son wants to be a cop when he grows up. That's the America I know. In the aftermath of the shooting, we've seen Mayor Rawlings and Chief Brown, a white man and a black man with different backgrounds, working not just to restore order and support a shaken city, a, a shaken department, but working together to unify a city with strength and grace and wisdom. And in the process, we've been reminded that the Dallas Police Department has been at the forefront of improving relations between police and the community. The murder rate here has fallen. Complaints of excessive force have been cut by 64 percent. The, the Dallas Police Department has been doing it the right way. And so Mayor Rawlings, and Chief Brown, on behalf of the American people, thank you for your steady leadership. Thank you for your powerful example. We could not be prouder of you. These men, this department, these, this is the America I know. And today in this audience, I see people who have protested on behalf of criminal justice reform grieving alongside police officers. I see people who mourn for the five officers we lost, but also weep for the families of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. In this audience, I see what's possible. I see what's possible when we recognize that we are one American family, all deserving of equal treatment, all deserving equal respect, all children of God. That's the America I know. Now, I'm not naive. I have spoken at too many memorials during the course of this presidency. I've hugged too many families who've lost a loved one to senseless violence. And I've seen how a spirit of unity born of tragedy can gradually dissipate, overtaken by the return to business as usual, by inertia, and old habits and expediency. I see how easily we slip back into our old notions because they're comfortable. We're used to them. I've seen how inadequate words can be in bringing about lasting change. I've seen how, how inadequate my own words have been. And so I'm reminded of a passage in John's Gospel. Let us love not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. If we're to sustain the unity we need to get through these difficult times, if we are to honor these five outstanding officers 
who we lost, then we will need to act on the truths that we know. And that's not easy. It makes us uncomfortable. But we're going to have to be honest with each other and ourselves. We know that the overwhelming majority of police officers do an incredibly hard and dangerous job fairly and professionally. They are deserving of our respect and not our scorn. And when anyone, no matter how good their intentions may be, paints all police as biased or bigoted, we undermine those officers we depend on for our safety. And as for those who use rhetoric suggesting harm to police, even if they don't act on it themselves, well, they not only make the jobs of police officers even more dangerous, but they do a disservice to the very cause of justice that they claim to promote. We also know that centuries of racial discrimination, of slavery and subjugation and Jim Crow, they didn't simply vanish with the end of lawful segregation. They didn't just stop when Dr. King made a speech or the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act were signed. Race relations have improved dramatically in my lifetime. Those who deny it are dishonoring the struggles that helped us achieve that progress. But we know <laughs> but America, we know that bias remains. We know it. Whether you are black or white or Hispanic or Asian or Native American or of Middle Eastern descent, we have all seen this bigotry in our own lives at some point. We've heard it at times in our own homes. If we're honest, perhaps we've heard prejudice in our own heads and felt it in our own hearts. We know that. And while some suffer far more under racism's burden, some feel to a far greater extent discrimination stink. Although most of us do our best to guard against it and teach our children better, none of us is entirely innocent. No institution is entirely immune. And that includes our police departments. We know this. And so when African Americans from all walks of life, from different communities across the country, voice a growing despair over what they perceive to be unequal treatment, when study after study shows that whites and people of color experience the criminal justice system differently. So that if you're black, you're more likely to be pulled over or searched or arrested. More likely to get longer sentences. More likely to get the death penalty for the same crime. When mothers and fathers raise their kids right and have the talk about how to respond if stopped by a police officer, yes, sir, no, sir, but still fear that something terrible may happen when their child walks out the door? Still fear that kids being stupid and not quite doing things right might end in tragedy? When all this takes place more than 50 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, we cannot simply turn away and dismiss 
those in peaceful protest as troublemakers or paranoid. We can't simply dismiss it as a symptom of political correctness or reverse racism. To have your experience denied like that, dismissed by those in authority, dismissed perhaps even by your white friends and co-workers and fellow church members again and again and again, it hurts. Surely we can see that, all of us. We also know what Chief Brown has said is true, that so much of the tensions between police departments and minority communities that they serve is because we ask the police to do too much and we ask too little of ourselves. As a society, we choose to underinvest in decent schools. We allow poverty to fester so that entire neighborhoods offer no prospect for gainful employment. We refuse to fund drug treatment and mental health programs. We flood communities with so many guns that it is easier for a teenager to buy a Glock then get his hands on a computer or even a book. And then we tell the police, you're a social worker. You're the parent. You're the teacher. You're the drug counselor. We tell them to keep those neighborhoods in check at all costs. And do so without causing any political blowback or inconvenience. Don't make a mistake that might disturb our own peace of mind. And then we feign surprise when periodically the tensions boil over. We know those things to be true. They've been true for a long time. We know it. Police, you know it. Protesters, you know it. You know how dangerous some of the communities where these police officers serve are. And you pretend as if there's no context. These things we know to be true. And if we cannot even talk about these things, if we cannot talk honestly and openly, not just in the comfort of our own circles, but with those who look different than us or bring a different perspective, then we will never break this dangerous cycle. In the end, it's not about finding policies that work. It's about forging consensus and fighting cynicism and finding the will to make change. Can we do this? Can we find the character as Americans to open our hearts to each other? Can we see in each other a common humanity? and a shared dignity, and recognize how our different experiences have shaped us. And it doesn't make anybody perfectly good or perfectly bad. It just makes us human. I don't know. I confess that sometimes I, too, experience doubt. 
I've been to too many of these things. I've seen too many families go through this. But then I am reminded of what the Lord tells Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart, the Lord says, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's what we must pray for, each of us. A new heart. Not a heart of stone, but a heart open to the fears and hopes and challenges of our fellow citizens. That's what we've seen in Dallas these past few days. And that's what we must sustain. Because with an open heart, we can learn to stand in each other's shoes and look at the world through each other's eyes. So that maybe the police officer sees his own son in that teenager with a hoodie who's kind of goofing off, but not dangerous. And the teenager, maybe the teenager will see in the police officer the same words and values and authority of his parents. With an open heart, we can abandon the overheated rhetoric and the oversimplification that reduces whole categories of our fellow Americans, not just to opponents, but to enemies. With an open heart, those protesting for change will guard against reckless language going forward. Look at the model set by the five officers we mourn today. Acknowledge the progress brought about by the sincere efforts of police departments like this one in Dallas. And embark on the hard but necessary work of negotiation the pursuit of reconciliation. With an open heart, police departments will acknowledge that just like the rest of us, they're not perfect. That insisting we do better to root out racial bias is not an attack on cops, but an effort to live up to our highest ideals. And I understand these protests, I see them, they can be messy. Sometimes they can be hijacked by an irresponsible few. Police can get hurt. Protesters can get hurt. They can be frustrated. But even those who dislike the phrase Black Lives Matter, surely we should be able to hear the pain of Alton Sterling's family. We should, when, when we hear a friend describe him by saying that whatever he cooked, he cooked enough for everybody, that, that should sound familiar to us, that maybe he wasn't so different than us, so that we can, yes, insist that his life matters. Just as we should hear the students and coworkers describe their affection for Philando Castile, as a gentle soul, Mr. Rogers with deadlocks, they called him, and know that his life mattered to a whole lot of people of all races, of all ages, and that we have to do what we can without putting officers' lives at risk, but do better to prevent another life like his from being lost. With an open heart, we can worry less about which side has been wronged and worry more about joining sides to do right. Because the vicious killer of these police officers, they won't be the last person who tries to make us turn on one another. The killer in Orlando wasn't, nor was the killer in Charleston. We know there is evil in this world. 
That's why we need police departments. But as Americans, we can decide that people like this killer will ultimately fail. They will not drive us apart. We can decide to come together and make our country the good inside us, the hopes and simple dreams we share. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. For all of us, life presents challenges and suffering. Accidents, illnesses, the loss of loved ones. There are times when we are overwhelmed by sudden calamity, natural or man-made. All of us, we make mistakes. And at times, we are lost. And as we get older, we learn we don't always have control of things. Not even the president does. But we do have control over how we respond to the world. We do have control over how we treat one another. America does not ask us to be perfect. Precisely because of our individual imperfections, our founders gave us institutions to guard against tyranny and ensure no one is above the law. A democracy that gives us the space to work through our differences and debate them peacefully, to make things better, even if it doesn't always happen as fast as we'd like. America gives us the capacity to change. But as the men we mourn today, these five heroes knew better than most, we cannot take the blessings of this nation for granted. Only by working together can we preserve those institutions of family and community, rights and responsibilities law, and self-government that is the hallmark of this nation. For it turns out we do not persevere alone. Our character is not found in isolation. Hope does not arise by putting our fellow man down. It is found by lifting others up. And that's what I take away from the lives of these outstanding men. The pain we feel may not soon pass, but my faith tells me that they did not die in vain. I believe our sorrow can make us a better country. I believe our righteous anger can be transformed into more justice and more peace. Weeping may endure for a night, but I'm convinced joy comes in the morning. We cannot match the sacrifices made by officers Zamaripa and Ahrens, Kroll, Smith, and Thompson. But surely we can try to match their sense of service. We cannot match their courage, but we can strive to match their devotion. May God bless their memory. May God bless this country that we love.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Please keep your seats while the families and special guests depart.